Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7997 in the name of Angus Robertson on retained EU law revocation and reform bill uh, UK legislation. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak button. And I call on Angus Robertson, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to and to move the motion up to seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to move the motion in my name. Today's debate is timely because the retained European Union Law Bill also begins its committee stage in the House of Lords. Uh, and may I begin by thanking the Constitution Ex uh, Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee for their report on retained EU law. It's clear that the committee share the significant concerns raised by the Scottish Government since the Bill's introduction. There's simply not enough time today to list these concerns in full, but allow me to highlight three. One, the Bill includes a cliff edge sunset provision, which is a deeply irresponsible way to manage the statute book. Two, it risks deregulation and divergence from the high standards the people of Scotland experienced and benefited from as uh, an, a European Union uh, member state. This will also introduce unwelcome uncertainty for business uh, and uncertainty for trade. And three, it includes powers for UK ministers to act in areas of devolved responsibility without the consent of Scottish ministers and without the consent of this parliament. To be clear, conferring powers on UK ministers in devolved areas without requiring the consent of the Scottish ministers or this parliament for the exercise of those powers strikes at the heart of the Scotland Act 1998. Democratic oversight and good governance is clearly at risk if UK ministers sideline in this way the Scottish ministers who are accountable to this parliament. The combined assessment of the committee's 18 expert witnesses was overwhelmingly negative and reflects the astonishing level of opposition to this legislation across sectoral and across political boundaries. And yet, the United Kingdom government refuses to withdraw this bill or, at the very least, to amend it. I call on them again, as I did in November, when this Parliament previously debated the bill, to see sense and to withdraw it. I'll restate the position of the Scottish Government, presiding officer. The only way to eradicate the dangers posed by this bill is for it to be scrapped. That remains our position. Nothing during the parliamentary passage of the bill has alleviated my initial grave concerns. Indeed, those concerns are compounded by my conversations with Welsh Government ministers and indeed with peers in the House of Lords. I'm alarmed that the hard Brexit negotiated by the UK Government could become even harder with signals from Europe uh, that the trade and cooperation agreement itself would be at risk by the UK's divergent and deregulatory agenda that informs this bill. It's highly regrettable that our proposed amendments to the bill have not been considered by two previous Secretaries of State. The third is now in post and I wrote to her two weeks ago urging her to respect devolution and to respect the role of this Parliament. I'm yet to receive a reply. The amendments to the bill that we have proposed to the Secretary of State for Business and Trade would ensure that this Parliament is given its proper scrutinising role and I'll continue to urge her to consider these amendments. In this regard, much will depend on the further parliamentary passage of this bill. I've instructed my officials to work closely with the parliamentary clerks here to find an agreeable way forward, and I commit to keeping this parliament updated on our proposals. We must be under no illusion that either devolution or the Sewell Convention will be respected in regard to this legislation. Since 2018, this Parliament has on seven occasions withheld consent for a UK Government bill. The UK Government has ignored it six times. Should this Parliament express a similar view today, I can offer no comfort that the UK Government will listen. I'll conclude by drawing attention to just some of the continued opposition uh, to this bill. The House of Lords Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee criticise it as being hyper-skeletal in allowing ministers to act with little parliamentary scrutiny. The UK Government's own watchdog, the Regulatory Policy Committee, called the impact assessment for the bill 
not fit for purpose. And Wildlife and Countryside Link called the bill, and I am quoting, an economic and environmental wrecking ball that could cost the UK £82 billion uh, over 30 years. To clear swathes of informed observers understand the danger of this bill. The Welsh Government understand this. The Scottish Government understands this. This Parliament's Constitution Committee understands this. So today I urge this Parliament as a whole to join this list and to vote in favour of the motion today to withhold consent. Did you move? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, did, did you move your... I did. You did. Thank you very comment. much indeed. Thank you. Um, I now call on Claire Adamson to speak on behalf of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee. Around five minutes, please, Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. May I firstly thank the SEAC Committee members, the Committee Clerks and all those who submitted evidence and attended committee during our deliberations on this important bill. And it is a bill of profound concern. The Committee believes, as a point of constitutional principle and simple democratic imperative, that Scottish Parliament should have an opportunity to effectively scrutinise the exercise of all legislative powers within devolved competence. The pill in its current form neither protects nor promotes that principle, nor does it encourage confidence when it comes to the potential impacts on policy areas as crucial and wide-ranging as food standards, animal health, safeguarding the environment, consumer protection, business practice and employment. Presiding officer, there was a consistency in the evidence of stakeholders that you rarely find in parliamentary scrutiny. Even those witnesses who favour diversion from EU policy, both historically and for the future, such as the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, said on this, on this it was more important to get it right than get it fast. The bill in its current form contains the sunset clause and if it's, it law is not retained specifically by either the UK or Scottish governments, it will automatically fall by the end of this year. Lorna Hood of the Faculty of Advocates said of the deadline, to put it plainly, we would end up with gaps in the law. The Society of of Chief Officers of Trading Standards, among many others, shared those concerns. Scottish Environment Link referred a much harsher cliff edge in devolved areas than reserved. The Delegated Powers and Legislative Reform Committee have also expressed serious concerns over this bill. Its House of Lords equivalent, Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee, stated that there is no certainty about the sunset provision itself because UK ministers can extend it under delegated powers in Clause 2. There is no certainty about which policy areas will be affected and there is no certainty about what will replace revoked rule. Seafood Scotland said that the legal cliff edge would force businesses and representatives to divert considerable resource to understanding and responding to the proposed changes. The National Farmer, Farmers Union of Scotland suggested the sunsetting of retained EU food law could well return us to a time when there was little in the way of standards applied. Let me be clear, presiding officer, witnesses were not opposed to the principle of reviewing retained EU law. But any review should not be driven by what Seafood Scotland called arbitrary cut-off dates. The Soil Association had, again, no objection to a sensible process of examining, updating or improving existed law, but we do not think that the bill as drafted delivers that. And given inflation, energy prices, post-pandemic recovery and the economic impact post-Brexit, you can but sympathise with the view of the Institute of the Directors that the bill is the last thing that business needs in a fragile economic environment. Presiding officer, the sunset clause as it stands cannot deliver appropriate levels of consultation, scrutiny or debate. The scale of the task ahead cannot be underestimated, both in terms of additional administrative burden and the challenge of conducting scrutiny within the time constraints. This applies for stakeholders, for governments and for this Parliament's committee. 
I have all committees, rather, sorry. I have already thanked my committee colleagues. It is to their credit that we have been able to work in such a productive and collegiate way this session. However, to note, we were unable to agree a unanimous report, uh, unanimous support for this report with Conservative colleagues on this occasion. Presiding officer, we cannot do justice to the report this afternoon, and we have indeed asked the conveners group for a committee-led debate to allow further discussion across committee interests, as this will impact on many subject committees of this parliament. We have also highlighted the potential impact on the workload of the parliamentary committees going forward. We have written to Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee in the requirement for a, le a legislative consent motion in this specific circumstance when consent is not to be laid by the government through a, a legislative consent motion. Our standing orders are silent on this at the moment and we therefore have, have requested a review of procedures given as the Cabinet Secretary laid out the number of times this has happened. This is of indeed concern for the committee and we recommend the report to our fellow committee members and members across the chamber. Uh, thank you for your time, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Adamson. <clears throat> I now call on Donald Cameron. Uh, around five minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, this is, of course, the second time that I write to speak in a, a Scottish Government debate on the uh, retained EU law bill, uh, this time for an LCM debate. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned, the Scottish Government held a debate on this bill in November uh, 2022, the timing of which, as I argued at the time, was unprecedented, given that two committees of the Parliament looking at the bill had not yet reported. And in terms of that issue, as the convener um, has just mentioned, the convener of the Constitution Committee has just mentioned, um, our committee has agreed to write to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to recommend that it, un it considers undertaking a review of the relevant provisions of standing orders. Uh, moving on from that issue, it is also arguable that the debate we are having today is uh, likewise premature because, as the Cabinet Secretary himself noted, the bill itself is not in final form. It was robustly debated in the House of Lords at the beginning of the month. Uh, it enters uh, committee stage um, right now, and there are reports that it will uh, possibly be amended. And in my view, it would have been preferable to wait until we could see um, the, uh, at least a finalised version of the bill before debating it again and before considering the issue of consent. However, we are uh, where we are. Our committee has published um, their report, um, the, our report on the bill, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has also published a report. And although I'm not speaking for the committee on this occasion, um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Constitution Committee clerks for all their work during the scrutiny of the LCM and the drafting of the final report. And while ultimately my Scottish Conservative colleague, Maurice Golden, uh, and I did not support the uh, conclusions of that report, I do acknowledge the hard work of both MSP colleagues and the clerking team of our committee. Uh, let me briefly uh, lay out our position on the bill itself. And I acknowledge there are several concerns about the rule bill, especially around timeframes. I retain some personal misgivings about various aspects of the bill. But in principle, I do not believe that the Scottish Parliament should refuse to consent to the bill. The bill, in our view, rightly seeks to end the inertia that currently exists when it comes to retained EU law on the statute book. And while there are concerns, my belief is that we cannot maintain a kind of statutory stasis uh, forever and ever. We temporarily kept EU laws in place to smooth the process of the UK's exit from the uh, EU. But this was always envisaged as a short-term bridging measure. Yeah, very briefly. Jenny Minto. I thank the member for taking an intervention. I'm interested in the definition of EU law because all of these laws were um, looked at by the parliaments of the United Kingdom uh, during the time of our membership. So, in fact, they are included on our statute, so they could be argued that they're already UK, Scottish, etc. law. Donald Cameron. 
I, I'm, I'm not sure that they were all um, on the statute book, and that's a, a question of, of legal interpretation. But um, I, I certainly acknowledge there were a lot. There was a lot of EU law that was either directly effective, or had been. Um, enshrined in UK law, but we're talking about retained EU law, and it is my belief that these laws cannot now uh, sit uh, inert ad infinitum. We have to move forward, taking the laws we want to keep, amending and updating them where necessary, and jettisoning those that are just not relevant or are contrary to the needs. I, I won't actually, I've got very little time, of either the UK or Scotland. Otherwise, there will be two separate statute books with completely different interpretative principles and case law. And in addition, the so-called um, dangers of the bill have, in my view, been overplayed. The UK government has repeated its commitments across a number of sectors, including those of international obligations, employment rights, and environmental protections. Uh, and in contrast, uh, presiding officer, the opportunities for the Scottish government have been downplayed because it is Scottish government policy to keep pace with EU law. And this bill facilitates that. The bill allows the Scottish government to maintain alignment with EU law uh, and the government can now choose to adopt any EU law that it sees fit, either as primary or secondary legislation. And to that end, I understand UK government officials have offered to help the Scottish government with the task of identifying uh, what uh, retained EU law is devolved or, resolved, uh, or reserved. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary will take that offer up, because, of course, Scotland is best served when our two governments work together. Uh, to conclude then, briefly, Presiding Officer, we retain some misgivings with regard to the timeframes in the bill, but we also believe that the Scottish Parliament should give consent to the bill. It offers Scotland an opportunity to remove outdated EU law, which is no longer right for us, and replace it with Scotland-specific legislation. And for those reasons, we will vote against the motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call on Sarah Boyack. Uh, around four minutes, please, Ms Boyack. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour has been clear. We do not support this retained EU law bill. And I'd like to start off by thanking all those who gave evidence to our SEAC committee on its implications and our clerks for their hard work in helping us pull together our report. My view is that this bill joins a long list of mistakes made by this UK Conservative government over the Brexit process, demonstrating an obsession with deregulation and destroying our relationships with our nearest neighbours without thinking through the damaging consequences. This bill delivers a legal cliff edge. Its impact has not been thought through, and it would mean that the UK government has to consider literally thousands of pieces of legislation and identify the ones it wants to keep. And that would be a massive diversion from the current issues facing our economy and our people. So not, I note uh, Donald Cameron's suggestion that our two governments work together. Of course I agree with that, but surely there's a better approach because this bill will create massive uncertainty and there's a real danger that important legislation will be forgot about and will disappear overnight. And the evidence in our SEAC committee report published last week highlighted important concerns about disease control and implications for people's health. And it was suggested that we'll see the impact of this bill when food standards drop and animal welfare is undermined. And as the RSPB have highlighted, this bill puts at risk air and water quality, species and habitats protections, and pesticides and chemical levels in food and water. So surely it would have been far better to consider which EU laws we would rather not have. Consult with stakeholders so they're able to get involved. Carry out risk assessments. Ask lawyers about the legal implications. Speak to producers and businesses. Discuss with campaigners and trade unions. Those laws that don't just need to be retained, but also think about the global climate crisis we're having and think about how we accelerate our pace of change. I have to say this is the worst possible time to be deleting legislation which protects our environment. It was absolutely striking that stakeholders are deeply worried about this bill. Roger Barker, Director of Policy and Governance at the Institute of Directors said, getting to grips with any resulting regulatory changes will impose a major new burden on business when it could do well without. The legislation would undermine workers' rights, and the then TUC General Secretary Francis de Grady described this legislation as a recipe for chaos. And the CBI has said that the government should instead focus on improving its trading relationships with the EU. I totally agree. We should be rebuilding our relations with our nearest neighbours, not trashing them further. So let's be clear. This bill is bad for business. 
the economy, for trade, for workers' rights, for health and safety and for environment. And critically, it also undermines devolution. And it's another example of the Tory government riding roughshod over devolution. That is not acceptable. So I do hope that as this bill progresses through the UK Parliament, there will be a, refuse, a rethink. And by refusing to give consent, I hope our Parliament will play our role in bringing about that rethink. In closing, Presiding Officer, we cannot forget that the transfer of power from the Legislature to the Executive in this bill also extends to our Parliament. It's absolutely vital we have parliamentary transparency and accountability. So I'd be very keen for the Cabinet Secretary to publish his government's plans for alignment to ensure our stakeholders and our Parliament's committees are consulted. Claire Adamson was absolutely right. We need a more comprehensive debate on this issue. Our stakeholders and our communities need certainty, accountability and transparency, not the legal cliff edge and bad government that this bill will deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Boyack. I now call on Willie Rennie. Around four minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. In many ways, this day was inevitable. As soon as the Brexit referendum was lost and the Conservative government saw a hard Brexit, cutting almost all formal arrangements with the EU, there was always going to be a need to manage this harsh transition. The sheer volume of European law contained within British law is enormous, and to unpick it is a horrendous task. It was always going to be so. In passing, I have to say, it is a lesson for those who argue that independence would be a breeze. It could be done within 16 months. Yet over six years later, into the Brexit process, we are still disentangling our relationship with the European Union. Yes, I thank the member for giving way. Just for the record, that my understanding is that nobody in the independence movement would suggest that all law since 1707 be unpicked or repealed on Independence Day. But will you agree that one of the things that's so uh, distressing about this bill is it's proposing to do exactly that with 4,000 pieces of extant law or something in that really? region. Uh, to be honest, I think both movements are as bad as each other on this. They were, they're promising far too much of a harsh transition far too early. Within 16 months, it was promised within 16 months an independent state would be established. And we can't go back on that now. I think both movements need to learn from each other so we don't repeat the mistakes uh, of the past. Uh, we were in a formal arrangement with Europe for just a few decades and with the United Kingdom for several centuries. So the task would be enormous. But whilst the Brexit issues are wholly predictable, there is no doubt they could have been handled differently so as to smooth the transition to the new arrangement. Better relationships with Europe and a more pragmatic approach with an acceptance of necessary cooperation would have made this process easier and it would have allowed for a greater involvement of the devolved administrations. With the EU Retain Law Bill, we have a steep cliff edge, I'll agree with the Minister on that, which dangerously and blindly dispenses with thousands of laws without a proper process with the Scottish Parliament. Instead, we could have had a more deliberative process, engaging all interested parties, just rightly as Sarah Boyack has highlighted, and reducing the significant and costly errors that could be forthcoming. The unwise process has also enabled, as we've witnessed today, the Scottish Government to indulge, sometimes in wild hyperbole, speculating about dire consequences without being able to specifically identify actual harms. And it is important we understand the actual harms. So with that in mind, I'm still intrigued as to how and when the Scottish Government has used its keeping pace powers granted by this Parliament. We worked hard with the Government to agree these measures. So I'm slightly surprised we still don't know how many times it has been deployed. In fact, when I raised this issue in the last debate about Brexit, the Employment Minister, Richard Lockhead, didn't have a clue what I was talking about. He seemed to think it was something to do with securing employment for people who had been made redundant. We need a government that's on top of its game with keeping pace powers, but it seems to have neglected that power for itself. 
We were the strongest voice against Brexit in the UK. We were right to oppose Brexit. It should not, however, be used as some means to an independence end. It's far too important for that. We need partnership with our neighbours, not using it as some political purpose. So despite our criticism of the Scottish Government's handling and their exotic hyperbole at times, we will support the Government to withhold consent. The Conservative Government have made an absolute hash of Brexit. They've managed to damage our economy and they've weakened our country. If only we had two governments who could work together. If only we had governments that would seek pragmatic solutions. Thank you, Mr Rennie. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to four minutes, please. Cabinet. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and, and sincere thanks to everybody that took part in this uh, short debate. Uh, can I just briefly uh, feed back on, on those contributions, if I may? Uh, Claire Adamson, the convener of the Constitution uh, Committee, highlighted the overwhelming strength of evidence to the committee about uh, how damaging this legislation uh, is. Um, Donald Cameron from the Conservative front uh, bench suggested it was premature to decline legislative uh, consent. I would have to say to him, though, that given everything that we know uh, about this bill so far, and indeed the evidence that's been presented to the committee, I do not agree with him that this Parliament should give the UK Government a blank cheque to continue. Um, he uh, called on the UK and Scottish Governments to work together, uh, ignoring the fact that the UK Government has ignored all amendments supported by the Scottish and Welsh governments. Again, a reason why, even at this late stage, they should uh, reconsider their opposition to granting legislative uh, consent. Uh, to Sarah Boyack, uh, who uh, uh, began her contribution by pointing out, in an eminently sensible way, uh, how an alternative course of action could have been proceeded with, were there pieces of retained EU law in the statute book that needed to be sunsetted in any way, perfectly um, able to have done that. But what the UK government has done is they've turned the whole process on its head, forcing every single piece of European legislation, devolved, reserved and in between, uh, to face uh, sunsetting. And can I say I, I very much welcome uh, the uh, opposition of the Labour Party to giving legislative uh, consent uh, to, to Willie Rennie and the Liberal Democrats, a party that now accept and are prepared to live with Brexit. Um, can I say to him, as I have said to him before, when he uh, appeals for the Scottish Government to work with the UK Government on matters, I have. I have written repeatedly to the UK Government on this. We have published uh, amendments uh, which are supported also by colleagues in the Welsh Government, none of which none of which have been accepted. To, so to suggest that there's a, uh, an, an issue of equidistance in critique, which he was making in his contribution, I reject. And uh, uh, n notwithstanding that, I welcome the uh, support by the Scottish Liberal Democrats to withhold legislative consent um, uh, today. Um, may I just uh, draw attention to a number of things in, in the short time that I have uh, left presiding uh, officer. Um, in terms of questions such as won't Scottish ministers get powers to preserve and amend uh, uh, retained EU law and therefore the concern of UK ministers acting in devolved areas without consent is overstated. Uh, no, it's not. The bill does give devolved ministers powers to preserve, revoke and amend uh, rule, but UK ministers are able to revoke rule in devolved areas at any time, even prior to and even after the 2023 uh, sunset, with no requirement, no requirement for consent. How can we possibly grant a blank check to the UK government in these circumstances? Moreover, only UK ministers have powers to extend the sunset date uh, to 2026. So the balance of power is unequal. All of this, all of this could have been solved. Could have been solved in the House of Commons, could be solved in the House of Lords at this present time. If the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party was prepared to go um, uh, and uh, make the case to the UK Government, who knows? Maybe they might be listened to. But we heard none of that, none of that from the Conservative benches uh, today. 
On the issue of timescale and decision-making, something that Sarah Boyack has raised repeatedly, and rightly so. She is absolutely right in this. No preservation or other instruments can be made under the bill unless and until it has received royal assent as an in force, which is expected to be around May 2023. Once this has happened, the Scottish Government would intend to lay secondary legislation to seek to ensure that laws are not lost at the end of 2023. And I would be content to come back in a further and extended debate to talk through how that may work and, and hopefully provide the assurances that Sarah Boyack requires. I'm happy to give uh, very way briefly. briefly. Can I say, as soon as we can get that, that would be very important. And if you could refer, sorry, if the Cabinet Secretary could refer to the references in the SEAC committee report, that would be very helpful. Cabinet Secretary. A absolutely and happy to. But I'm sure Sarah Boyack does understand that we're still in the middle of a process of trying to understand the course of action being pursued by the uh, UK Government. So as soon as we have clarity on that, we're trying to work with them uh, to understand how things will proceed. We'll be able to come back to Parliament. I wish to be able to do that as soon as possible. Presiding officer, I mentioned in my opening remarks that since 2018 this Parliament has been ignored on six occasions when voting to withdraw, withhold consent to a UK Government bill. Regardless, I urge members to vote in favour of the motion today to agree with the recommendation to withhold consent for this bill. The UK Government may not be listening, but the people of Scotland are. Workers whose employment rights are at risk because of this bill, they will hear. Consumers who want higher food standards, they will hear. Those who benefit from and value the high quality in the Scottish environment, they will hear. And business wanting to avoid even more barriers to accessing the European market, they will hear too. Presiding officer, I urge this Parliament to add its voice to the already loud chorus from across Scotland and the United Kingdom who are opposed to this bill and vote in favour of the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on retained EU law revocation reform bill UK legislation. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business uh, to allow anybody to change position should they wish. Thank you.